Well, welcome back. So glad that you are with me today and so glad that we are continuing our study in the Gospel of John. I'm Pam Perno. I'm the teaching director of the CBS class and I'm delighted to uh, be studying uh, the Gospel of John with you. So um, as we begin, let me just open us in prayer and we will get started. Father, I just ask you to come, to speak. Um, may our hearts be tender. May your words penetrate our lives and transform it. Uh, Father, we pray that you would be glorified in this message, um, that it would be delivered in a manner that glorifies you and that is clear and understandable. Um, and Father, we just ask this in the name of Jesus. We pray this in, in your name. Amen. So Jesus has proclaimed that he is the bread of life, that he is the living water. And now in chapter 8 of John, he says that he is the light of the world. Now, keep in mind that he continues to, um, just as he did in John 8, he, his audience is still those who are religious, um, both the religious leaders and those who are devoutly religious in the crowd as well. Um, they are coming together in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, and Jesus continues, he goes into discourses um, in the temple square and um, presents himself in a number of ways. And, and so this one is just kind of a continuation of the previous chapter in chapter seven. So you and I would have thought that, and Jesus standing up and proclaiming that I am the light of the world, which in essence is that I am the Messiah, that you, that the, the people would have been rejoicing, that there would have been anticipation as they listened to Jesus's next words. But he wasn't met with excitement and uh, rejoicing. Instead, he was uh, the response to his teaching was cynicism, uh, it was doubt, and it was total rejection as well. In no other chapter of the Bible does Jesus make so many declarations about who he is, about himself, about his divinity. Here he asserts his divine identity through a series of I am statements. He says that I am the light of the world in verse 12. I am from above from verse 23. I am he, the Christ. Um, he states that in 24 and in 28, and he says, I am who bears witness of myself and the Father who sent me, in verse 18. Now, in verses 1 through 11, we see the compassion of Jesus that he shows as he forgives the woman who's caught in adultery. And then in verses 15 or 12 through 59, we will identify within those, those, that section five reasons why people will reject the Messiah. So first, we're going to start out with Jesus forgives an adulterous woman. This is in verses 1 through 11. Now, the earliest manuscripts of John, um, this is not um, included, the story of the adulterous woman. And even though it's not a passage that was written by John, it's still regarded to be a true story. That the actions and the words are still consistent with what we know of Jesus and it is also consistent in the rest of the Gospels. So there's no new or unusual information. Um, so it, it, it does deserve our consideration. And it deserves the consideration in teaching and preaching as well. Um, because it's an act that Jesus probably did at some point in his ministry. For it illustrates what, how Jesus had compassion for sinful people. Which includes all of us, right? And his willingness to forgive any sinner. So we start out in verse 1, that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. It begins early one morning as Jesus is teaching in the, in the uh, outer courts of the temple. And abruptly, he is interrupted with an angry um, group of, of scribes, the Pharisees. They were rigid in their legalism, and they interrupted the Lord's lesson. And they made this woman stand before the group. She had been caught in the very act of adultery. And because of that, she was perfect bait for a trap, for their trap for Jesus. They really didn't care about Jesus' opinion, nor were they trying to bring about justice. They merely hoped to find some means of trapping him with his own words. And they forgot the very obvious fact that catching someone in the very act of adultery involves catching two people, but they only brought the woman. They ignored the man's sin and put the woman on display just to trap Jesus. So how tragic is it that they were so quick to point out their sin of another and so blind to their own, especially the sin of not recognizing that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. So then Jesus says in verse 5, he says, and I need to get in chapter 8, but in verse 5 he says to them, 
now in the law, um, or they say, so they say to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So now what do you say? Now this was a thorny question. Um, it was tricky because the law of Moses condemned adulterers to be stoned publicly, but Roman law reserved that execution to be done by the Roman courts only. So never mind that the Jewish leaders had already disregarded the law by bringing only the one, um, bringing only the one, which was the woman without the man, as the law would have required. But in addition, they didn't have authority to stone the woman uh, without Rome's uh, permission. It was a perfect setup. To honor God's law, Jesus would have incurred the wrath of Rome. And if he submitted to Roman law, Jesus would have ignored the law of God. And so what does he do? Before the men had even finished their speech, Jesus bends down, he stoops over, he begins to write something in the sand with his finger. And what we're, uh, what he wrote, we're not told. Uh, there's been lots of speculation over what it was. But whatever he wrote, he wrote in the sand. But they were single-minded in their desire to have Jesus tracked by his own words. And so they kept pressing him, just like a little child, pressing Jesus for an answer. So eventually he stood up and he issued a challenge to them. And he said it in verse 7. In verse 7 he said that, and as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he resumed his writing. So you can know that by one by one, oldest to the youngest, the hypocritical judges begin to slip away into the crowd. And they left the woman standing in the center of the court. So now Jesus turns to the woman. He stands up and he says to her, and I love, I love, it always makes me love Jesus more when I read some of these stories. But he says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no, my Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I. So go, and from now on, sin no more. The only one who was worthy to judge this woman, the one who could have condemned her by the law, he was he refused to condemn her, and instead he extended compassion, grace, and forgiveness. And true to his word that we found in John 3, 16, he did not come to condemn the lost, but to save them. I thought, how precious is this story? How precious is our Savior, the Lord of Jesus Christ? How gracious is he? While those legalistic and cruel religious leaders gave no thought or compassion to this woman, God saw her. He saw her in her shame. He saw her in her humiliation. But he saw her. What they had intended for evil God intended for good because in that moment when he saw her, he turned his gaze on her. And, and even in the most humiliating way, she met the one and only who had the right to condemn her but didn't. Instead, he forgave her of her sin. He made her clean and he transformed her life. I love the scripture and Psalm. Description, it's a description of the scripture in Psalm 116 too, and it says, because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. I thought this was so precious. Jesus was bending into the sand, but he turned to the women. He turns to her and he sees her. He sees her shame. He sees her humiliation. He listened to her heart cry and he restored her from her sin and shame. My friends, no matter what or where you are facing now, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, he is a God who bends down. He listens to you. He sees you. He is filled with compassion and with grace. So allow him then to forgive you of your sin and to make you clean. Allow him to restore and to transform your life from the inside out because he is indeed a God of grace. So what a wonderful story, and it moves us right into the next session, section, which tells us about, it gives us the five reasons why people reject the Messiah, starting in verses 12 through 59. But let me first set the scene for you, because chapter 8, it continues the discourse that Jesus was having with the religious leaders during that Feast of Tabernacles. And over several days, Jesus would 
teach in the temple courts, and the visitors that came, those who were devout religious, would come and they would hear his teaching as they came to worship and they would come and go. Now, he was near the, treasure, the temple treasury and he begins to address the crowd. Now, the t treasury was located in the women's court or the court of women. And within that court, there were 13 large um, trumpet shaped bronze containers. Um, and they were used to collect offering from those who came into the temple. And they were bronze. Um, and so every time someone would put their offering in, they would hear it. And so whoever put in the largest amount would make the largest sound. But every evening during the Feast of Tabernacles, just after the evening sacrifice and before sunset, the priests would enter the court of, of women and they would light uh, four giant chandelier-like uh, lampstands. The, the light from those lampstands lamp stands, would light up all of Jerusalem. And it reminded the Israelites the pillar of fire in the, um, at night in the cloud by day that Jesus or that God used to lead them to the wilderness. So perhaps just think just for a moment, perhaps the priests begin to set each hanging lamp aflame and Jesus stands up and he declares, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. Now that was a sweeping statement that he made and it had to have caught the attention of the religious worshipers in the temple. Because the rabbis taught that when the Messiah came, he would be clothed with the light of the sun. And so Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Now, light symbolizes uh, the holiness of God. Uh, Jesus' claim to be light would have caught the attention of the crowd because he made such an exclusive claim. He didn't say that I am a light or one of many, but he said, I am the light, the one and only source of truth. And not only that, he was the one true light for all people, not just the Jews. He goes on in verse 14 that says, Whoever follows me will walk in, will never walk in dark, darkness, but will have the light of life. So all that the world has to offer, all that religion has to offer, is at very best a temporary light giver. But Jesus declares that I am the light of the world. And his statement implies that you are in darkness unless you follow him. So stop for a second and look at his offer. He's saying that if you choose to follow me, if you give me your heart, if you let me invade your life, then you will no longer walk in darkness, but you will have the promised light. So can you recall in the past when you have surrendered, when you finished with religion? Because I, there is a difference between religion and relationship. So when you were finished with religion and all the empty promises of the world, and you wanted not religion, but you wanted a relationship with the very one who created you and offers you salvation. Do you remember that moment in time? That is the offer that Jesus is making. He says, follow me, the light, and you will no longer live in the darkness. So now why would people reject such an offer? So in this section, now we see there are five reasons why the people reject the Messiah. They, uh, they reject because of lack of knowledge, a lack of perception, lack of appropriation, lack of desire, and lack of humility. So we're going to look at the first one, the lack of knowledge. And then we find this in verses 13 and 14. And the Pharisees say to Jesus, you are bearing witness about yourself, your testimony is not true. But Jesus answers back to them, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I'm coming from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. Now, Jesus did not disagree with the Jewish law that required that there was two witnesses, that two witnesses were needed for a valid testimony in a capital offense. Instead, what he did do is he claimed that his testimony was true even if no one else bore witness because he knew his origin and his destiny. In other words, Jesus knows God the Father, and the words that Jesus spoke were from the Father himself. When Jesus spoke, not only was he testifying for himself, but because he spoke the words of God, God was testifying for him as well. They knew the scriptures, but they didn't know God. They lacked knowledge. Now, there was a pastor who tells a story that he was on a flight home 
And he always hated to, um, if someone would strike up a conversation to say what his profession was. And so there was a young woman sitting beside her, uh, beside him, who struck up a conversation. And eventually she asked, you know, what do you do for your job? And he replied that he was a pastor. And she immediately just says, you know, I don't believe anything that, about the Bible. I don't believe any of it is true. And so he says, oh, yeah, uh, really? Well, tell me why. And she says, well, if the Bible was true, then how is it that Noah could have swallowed a, wh a whale? Did you get that? That Noah could have swallowed a whale. I don't tell jokes very well, do I? I, I miss the punchline every time. But I thought that was funny because the thing is, is I wouldn't believe it either if, if someone told me that Noah swallowed a whale. But she did not know, she did not have the knowledge of what the scripture truly said. Some people don't accept Jesus as the Messiah because they don't have the adequate information about him. And they haven't been told or they have been told wrongly. Our job as believers and followers of Jesus Christ is to testify to the truth to know the scriptures and to handle the scriptures correctly and to share with those who are misinformed or have a mistaken understanding of it, to the, the truth. And we do it with love. So then the next reason that people reject the Messiah is lack of perception. And we find that in verses um, 15 and 23. Yeah, Jesus, uh, Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it's not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. And then verse 23, he says to them, You are from below, but I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. To understand the things of God, one must have a spiritual perception of it. The religious experts were judging according to the flesh. That is that they discerned on natural and physical terms. Um, they lacked a spiritual dimension to their thinking. Um, and that kept, kept them from comprehending spiritual truths. So some people reject the, Jesus as the Messiah because they refuse to accept anything that they can't see or can't touch or is, can't be weighed or tested. And to them, nothing exists beyond the tangible. This is not, uh, not just a mere lack of knowledge, but it's a choice to reject the reality of anything that is supernatural or spiritual truths. Um, they, the, the spiritual truths have no meaning to them. So there is a depth perception of truth, um, or they have no depth perception of truth. And why is that? And Jesus answers the question when he says, because they are of this world. They were earthbound, but not, and Jesus is, is, is heavenly bound. A eternal bound. So for anyone to understand the spiritual truths, the Holy Spirit has to illuminate it. He has to illuminate the truth. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us that spiritual perspective. You and I need that spiritual perspective too as we study God's word. And that's why we always say in CBS to always pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you in understanding. Even in passages that you've read before, ask him to illuminate it in a new and fresh way. So we need to have a spiritual perspective. And those who reject Jesus as the Messiah oftentimes lack that perception. So now they also, the next one, uh, the third reason why they would reject uh, Jesus as the Messiah is they lack appropriation. Now this is in verses 31 through 38. And so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then they answered him, But we are the offspring of Abraham, and we've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answers them. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. I know that you are an offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place, no progress in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do not, um, and you do what you have heard from your father. Very clear what Jesus is saying to them. The thing is, is that we can have knowledge of the word of um, and of Jesus Christ, and we can perceive the things of God, but we don't appropriate them. If the word makes no progress, progress within us, 
um, and then we will reject the truth. In verse 31, Jesus addressed the Jews who claim to believe him, but not all will remain true disciples. He says to them, if you desire to be a true disciple, um, their belief in him must be followed by obedience, a willingness to follow the one to whom they have declared their faith. That is an appropriation or appropriating the word. Jesus said that his word had made no progress in them. Um, uh, and so what they did, what they needed to do was they needed to abide in his word in order to appropriate the truth. In verse 31, it says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and truth will set you free. So abide or remain in him. It's an initial response that, um, that we re have um, with the invitation of salvation. We ask him to come into our hearts, right? He can, to come and abide in us, to dwell within us. But it's also a continuous response that we have to have um, to the one that we serve. And we do that throughout our faith journey. So the religious experts, they had been exposed to the word of God because it was their job. It was their job to copy the manuscripts and to learn the principles um, that it contained and then to apply them to their everyday life. However, the tragedy, a tragedy is that they never allowed it, the print on the page, to penetrate um, and make it into their hearts. They failed to internalize what they had claimed they cherished. You know, there is a danger of overexposure. We can become overexposed to the word and we become callous to the Holy Spirit. You know, I've heard women who have been in CBS before say, oh, yes, I do. I do a Bible study on Wednesdays, I do one on Thursday mornings, and then I have another one on the weekend. And wonderful, I love it, be in the Word of God. But there is a danger to overexposure. And what I mean by that is when we are overexposed, sometimes we can become callous. We say, oh yeah, I've, I've already read that. I've already studied that. I know that one. And we're callous to the Holy Spirit. So uh, when CBS, our lesson centered on John 3.16, we were challenged in our CBS lesson to ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate that scripture in a fresh new way. Each time we sit down to read God's word and to study it, and each time we bend our knees in prayer, we should invite the Holy Spirit to illuminate in a very fresh way God's word. So the thing is, is we have to abide. We have to appropriate God's word. We need to allow it to make a transformation of our lives from the inside out. Now, the fourth reason people will reject the Messiah, Jesus Christ as the Messiah, is a lack of desire. And we find that in 39 through 47. They answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. And then in verse 44, he says that you are, the fa um, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. You know, sons copy their fathers, but the Jewish leaders did not behave like one, like the one whom they claimed was their father, which was Abraham. Abraham believed and he obeyed, but instead what they wanted to do was kill Jesus. So their true father wasn't Abraham, and you could tell that by their actions. Jesus answered, if God were your father, then you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. So you are um, of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You know, the person's actions, they reveal what is within their heart. And the religious leader, leaders sought to kill Jesus, which was the work or the desire of their father. John 3, 19 says that the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Some people don't want to give up that which they know the light will expose. However, the thing is, is that they fail to recognize that instead of them being master over their own choices, their choices begin to master them. The Jews were proud that they were slaves to no one, but the truth is that we are all slaves to someone. We're either slaves to righteousness, and our master then is Jesus Christ, or we are slaves to sin, and our master is Satan. Our actions will reveal to whom we serve, and it is the desire of our heart that prompts that. 
and their desire to reject Jesus Christ comes from a heart that follows after the things of this world. So the fifth reason that people reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah is lack of humility. And that we find in verses 52 through 53. The Jews said to them, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham dies, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will not taste death. death. He will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Now, religious people or those who consider themselves good will have sometimes the greatest difficulty in believing in Jesus Christ. And the reason why is because they don't see themselves as a sinner in need of a savior. The religious experts rejected Jesus as the Messiah because they thought that they had outgrown the need for a savior. They thought they were superior spiritually, and they thought their heritage was good enough. They thought that their works was good enough, and that their knowledge was good enough. But it's been said, the only way to the cross is on your knees. So there is an attitude today of spiritual superiority, and it is prevalent today. People will say that they're Christians just because they're Americans, right? You know, my husband... His, his family um, had been members of a church since its inception. And my husband took great pride that he was a third-generation Galilean. But just because he was a third-generation Galilean, it didn't mean that he was a Christian. You cannot be grandfathered into faith. Each person has to come and make a personal commitment to believe and to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So proof of your salvation is in your actions and to whom you are obedient to. So it is clear from our lesson that Jesus is who he claimed to be. You cannot deny it. He is the light of the world. He's the bread of life. He's the living water. He is from above. He is Christ the Messiah, the great I am. Jesus warned in chapter 8 that there would be a coming judgment. And he stated very clearly that if those who fail to believe in him, that they will die in their sins. And this is the worst that can happen to a person. For it is to die before ever repenting of your sin or your sinful lifestyle. Or ever having any of our guilt or sin covered by the blood of Christ. Remember, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That is the offer he gives to you. And that offer still stands today. The truth has been given. And I trust that the Lord, um, I trust that with the Lord's help, it's been given to you straight, right? So if you haven't asked Jesus Christ into your heart, if you haven't accepted his offer of salvation, do so today. And if you are indeed a child of God, ask the Holy Spirit to continue to lead you in knowledge of God, to adjust your perception of God, to appropriate his word so it penetrates your heart, to increase your desire for the things of God, and to humble you before the Lord so that he might be exalted. Follow him. He's worthy of our praise, but he is worthy also of your obedience and your desire to follow. He will honor that and he will bless you. Now, my friends, we are going to be on Christmas break until January 6th. And I really pray that you will have just a very blessed Christmas. One filled with joy, knowing that Jesus Christ still sits on the throne. Let's close in prayer. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ever hope or imagine. To you be all the glory, the honor, and the praise now and forevermore. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Blessings to you. Have a wonderful Christmas. And I will see you in the new year.